One of the more distinguishing features about IDA is a very sophisticated type system uh, that has a lot of unique things about it, like declaring new instances of even base types. Uh, that's something that you really don't see very often. And also uh, subtyping, which is used to sort of do an inheritance-like thing uh, with base types. Now, exactly why this would be useful or how to use it is not obvious if you're coming from a lot of other languages, or at least not potentially obvious. Maybe you can come up with a few examples uh, on your own. But there are a few other things about Ida, like attributes, that really warrant a explanation, demonstration, tutorial on its type system. For this video, we're going to be doing just the basic types, so integer, floating points, modulars, and uh, fixed points. Uh, arrays, records, t uh, tagged records, and things like that are going to be in later videos. So let's begin by showing off just the integers. A in the standard package, there is a few predefined types. Uh, this is pretty similar to the intrinsic types that would be defined in other platforms. And there is a standard integer, so you don't need to constantly define your own integer. And in fact, in most instances, I would just recommend using the standard types. So. Assigning a value to an integer is pretty straightforward. We can just do a integer and just assign it one. And if we want to actually make this do something, let's uh, print that out. A is. Now, here we get into one of the first attributes, the image attribute. And this is used to convert any type that supports it into a string. So, uh, in a language like, uh, say, C Sharp, where you have a toString method that's defined for all instances of objects, this is similar to that. Now, if we pull up a terminal, go away. You can see that it does actually print that out. Now, just to show off a few more attributes first, uh, since they're pretty useful things to know. For those of you who are already familiar with Ada, you'll notice a little problem's about to happen, but I'm doing this just to show it off. It complains about invalid operators here, and this is because Ida's approach to types is strict enough to where concatenation can only be done between characters and strings. Uh, given that the integer first and integer last attributes will return integers themselves, uh, they can't be concatenated this way, so we need to actually call image on this as well. I personally do not like that this is a thing that you have to do. Um, that being said, Ida really isn't meant for uh, text processing, so I, I get it. Th this, uh, I get it. I, I, I just wish it could be a little bit different. <laughs> But now it actually compiles, and you can see that oh, it works. Now these happen to be huge numbers, and for those familiar with uh, the under underlying stuff about the CPU, you'll notice that this is two's complement, and uh, or that this indicates a high probability of it being two's complement, and that it is in fact. Uh, just uses the exact same integer type that's defined on the CPU. So, 
when you would want to use the first and last uh, attributes, you have to do quite a bit more with when you have your own types defined. Uh, let's show off actually defining a type and then I can show a little bit more about when first and last are actually useful. So let's do uh, type person. Yeah, let's do this. Uh, so that's it, assuming I didn't make any typos. And I did not. So what this does is defines an entirely new integer type named percent. Uh, it is incompatible with any other integer type. So we can show that off by doing uh, uh, 50% and put this here. So as I said, it is incompatible. Uh, now the image attribute, as well as basically all attributes, are essentially like an intrinsic method, as I had mentioned before. Uh, so when we defined the uh, percent type, it was automatically defined for us as well. So if we change this over to percent, this will now work. And this is even the case if we, instead of just defining a new type, actually uh, like inherit from the integer. Uh, now what is it? Is new integer? Yes. Okay. So if we change this again back to the integer, this should fail again. And it does. Now the difference between these two uh, with the uh, inheritance versus just this has to do with the range of the base type, at least in this instance, because it's an integer, it's defined by its range, it's first and last. Um, I'll show off this failing and it should be a little bit more obvious. So let's do it uh, this way. Because this is inheriting from the percent, and you can see that the percent only goes up to 100, this should effectively fail because the range is going uh, going all the way up to 500, while we're taking the base of uh, a number that only goes up to 100. And you can see that it does fail the constraint test. If we, however, uh, incorporate from the integer. This is totally acceptable. Yeah, that, just to make that error go away. But uh, essentially, if you leave this out, it's just an implicit new integer. If you put anything else in there, then it borrows from the base, essentially. Now sometimes you don't actually want to do that, and you may actually want to keep the, uh, the new type compatible with the old one. And that is done through what's called subtyping. In this instance, you must have the parent type. If we leave this out, you can see that it will complain. The subtype indication is expected, which is this whole thing. I don't like that error message, but uh, yeah, whenever you see that, it's because you left out the parent type from the subtype. And so with these being compatible, you can either use the subtype image or even the parent image and in both instances, these will compile and... will work, unlike my typing. Subtypes can even be compatible with each other. So if we do a different subtype... Uh, 
Um, you can see that this does work. Now, the thing to keep in mind, however, is that the checks are still done and are done automatically. And this is sort of where it becomes uh, useful, where all of this type system really uh, starts to show why you'd want to use it at all. So you can see that the compiler does notice that this is going to happen. It, it does not cause a failed compilation because this is a totally valid statement, but the compiler does catch that E is currently 250, which is way outside of this range specified here. So even though they are compatible to an extent that they can be assigned to each other, the range check still occurs and it will uh, well, if we run this, it will throw the appropriate exception. So this, for the most part, shows off uh, what I want to show. Uh, there are a few other things that uh, do need to cover. And let's do... Um, Ah yes, the range attribute. So let's clear this off and do for uh, what i n integer range. Uh, actually, no. Let's not do that large of a range. That's going to generate a lot of text. Could you put mine? Uh, uh, So you can see that it printed off the subtypes range. The range attribute essentially combines the first and last attributes in a way that uh, is recognized as a full range declaration. So in many other languages, what you'd wind up having to do is the hard-coded 1 through 100 and if you ever change this definition, you'd have to also change this definition, and it can kind of be tricky to track all that down. Um, this... I'm trying to come up with good real-world examples of when you'd want to use these. Unfortunately, beyond some simple numerics things like percent types, uh, you know, it can often, for a lot of things, you need a constrained percent where it's somewhere between 1 and 100. Uh, obviously, you can have greater percents. Uh, but, uh, say, like, compression levels uh, are always specified as something between... Uh, not compression levels. Um, there's a... And it sort of has to do with compression, but there's like a quality level that I, I believe it's JPEG uh, image files have uh, that is specified somewhere between uh, one and or I don't know if it's zero, maybe zero wouldn't make a whole lot of sense though, uh, and a hundred percent. And based on how high or low that is, it affects the quality of the uh, image that's generated. Uh, this is useful for that kind of thing, so that. Uh, you can essentially have all your checks written out everywhere you use that type uh, just by writing out the subtype or even a, a full incompatible type. Uh, more than anything, where this really shines is with hardware. Uh, other than that, I haven't seen too much of a use for it, uh, but it's there. Uh, it does have its uses. More than anything, what you want to get out of this would be the attributes. Uh, for the other types, that's pretty much all we're going to cover is just the attributes. So if we go into modulars instead, and standard doesn't have one of these, we'll have to actually define one ourselves. But the type declaration just looks like this. 
So in this instance, we're defining an 8-bit modular. Uh, you could write in your own value here, like uh, 16 or even 14. It doesn't have to be a power of 2. But the exponentiation syntax kind of makes it obvious that you're doing an 8-bit uh, 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 modular. And uh, let's do modular. Oh, I've got that, and modular image, we do, uh, Ah, uh, yes, because this was for, uh, doing a uh, it's an operation, not not the request for what this is. Mm. I'm gonna have to look up. I'm gonna have to look this up. Give me a second. I think I remember what it was. It's just that there's um, modules. There's two remarkably similar named uh, attributes. Right, that whole thing. Uh, how do we get the result? I wonder if that returns just a generic one. Yes, okay, so that works. Um, that's okay. So what's going on here is that modulars are essentially unsigned integers. Uh, I really don't like calling them that because at least from my educational experience an unsigned integer would just uh, overflow, whereas a modular is something like a, a clock arithmetic where it wraps around. Um, the way it works inside the processor, typically, although it does depend on what processor architecture we're talking about, is that it wraps around. Uh, some of these do catch the situation and throw an overflow exception, treating it just like an integer, uh, the standard signed integer. Uh, but this is sort of processor specific, and uh, actually being able to specify the behavior you want in Ida is rather nice. Uh, for the other type of unsigned behavior, the one I described where it still overflows, uh, Ada has what's known as a natural and a positive subtype of integer. The natural includes zero, whereas positive does not. Uh, so you can use the specific type of unsigned that you want. Uh, the explanation of the uh, attributes here, first and last, work the exact same way as the integers, whereas modulus returns the thing we specified here. Uh, now, 2 raised to the power of 8 does come out to 256. We could just the same write that in here. And we get the same result. But I'll switch back to that. And what the other one I was trying to use in Modulus's place essentially goes like this. Let's do... Uh, I believe we can do something like a thousand, and then M is... So what this does is calculates the uh, what's essentially the modulo operator, uh, and I do want to be a little bit careful about that because there is actually a mod operator in Ada. Uh, these essentially do the same thing. This just implicitly uses the modulus here, or the same thing. Uh, we can actually kind of synthesize this by doing this. Except we need some casts. So,
So, obviously, <laughs> what we wrote before is immensely less writing, and that's basically why you'd want to use it. Uh, I think that's everything for mod. Um, you know, let me, let me try something. I actually have no idea if this works at all. Uh, we don't need this. But it's a, it's a way to find out. So for uh, M, 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 M. Okay, so it has it. Um, yeah, that should essentially be everything for mods. So then let's go on to... Uh, floating points, since these are really the most interesting for most people nowadays. As with most other languages, there is an implicitly defined floating point type. However, in Ida, it gets a little bit more complicated because, as you'll see as we go through this, there's quite a bit of ability to define very specifically the floating point type. And so this means that unlike, say, C or C++, where there's a single precision and double precision floating point type, uh, in IDA there are, on most platforms, four different, no, 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 three different uh, precisions. Some will have four, and... I'm sure there are some exceptions from that as well, because there's a lot of different platforms that uh, there have uh, added targets for. Uh, but essentially, it looks like, and I may forget this one. Uh, okay, that worked. So let's do uh, put line and flip first. Obviously, massive, massive numbers. And potentially, we can go even larger uh, depending on whether it can find one that is. Uh, well, it, it, it will. I, I already know offhand it will. That is a ridiculously large number. And if you really know your floating point types, you should recognize that that is in fact the 80-bit float that is available on uh, the x86 and whatever you want to call the 64-bit version of it. Uh, so that is an absolutely massive floating point type, considerably larger than what's available on a lot of other systems. And I have noticed, uh, not so much with C and C++, but I have seen a few instances of languages that their double precision float is the 64-bit, even on platforms that have an 80-bit float available to them. So being able to use this is quite nice, actually. And just to show off, Yeah, you can actually tell. Uh, so the exponents on these are in fact the same, but if you look especially at the um, at some of the smaller digits, you can see that these do not actually have the same range, that we lost a little bit by excluding one digit. And a little bit more. And this sort of works the other way around. Although, yeah, that's that's still pretty large, all things considered. Although the precision there is terrible. And uh, since I didn't show that off, for floats, there is something called a small. 
That is the smallest change that can happen between each representable uh, float. So let's show that off as well. Now, as you would expect for a floating point with a precision of one digit, it's going to be very, very bad. There is not actually a lot of representable floats there. Uh, let's try something again, because I don't know if this is something we can do. I don't think so. Yeah, no. Because uh, the range is inevitably a... Uh, The range needs to be a discrete type. But there's something. Yeah, it's it's not important. It's not important. So one other thing to show about show for this before uh, I think it's digits, anyways. But before we start to compare a few uh, floating precisions again. Um, oh. oh, yes. Uh, digits returns an integer, not a float, so we need to do that instead. So as you can see, we went up immensely in the uh, precision that this was able to represent. And you can go even further. But that's not really that interesting. So the other thing I want to show off, uh, the last part about this actually, is that like with the other types, you can specify a range to this as well. So we can do things like... Uh, So, in this instance, it's still using the incredibly uh, precise small that an 18-digit uh, float can represent, but it's ensuring that the float is always between these two values. So, essentially, we have the percent all over again, but with an incredible amount of precision. One other thing I should mention uh, just before I forget is that this, like anything else, does support subtypes. Um, the one thing you want to be aware of, however, is that uh, with a subtype you can only declare a new range. You cannot declare a new digit precision. Uh, the only way to have a uh, float of a different digit precision is to declare an entirely new floating uh, point type which of course makes them incompatible. And there are conversions between them, uh, but subtypes with their automatic conversion, they're not really converted, that's kind of the thing, um, can only be uh, have a different range. Well, for fixed types, we have two of them to show off, actually. Uh, let's do this way, actually. Ah, okay. I do forget things like that sometimes. So, uh, let's specify a range of negative uh, 100 through, well, there. I wish, I really wish Ida would allow implicit conversions between certain sane things. 
Like, an integer being implicitly converted to a fixed point type makes perfect sense. Uh, floats as well. An integer to a float makes perfect sense. Uh, there's a number of implicit conversions that should not exist, uh, that should only be allowed to be explicit, but having to add in the point zero for something like that is just stupid, in my opinion. Uh, it, it's obvious, I think, to everybody that you're not losing any precision by just having the two, but uh, yeah, you've, you've, you've got to do this. I forget all the time, but I, it's just dumb, I think. But there. Now, the delta is very similar to the small that exists for floating point types. Uh, it's essentially you specifying what the smallest uh, interval between each representable uh, fixed point is at least for the ordinary fixed point. Now that is ordinary as regards to the computer. So this is a base two fixed point type. The other type is base 10. I'll get into that a little bit after we cover the ordinary a bit more. Uh, but just know that it is ordinary from the perspective of the computer, not you. So delta works, well, it, the delta attribute is essentially the exact same uh, thing as the small, so let's just get that out of uh, ordinary. Yeah. Is that right? Uh, oh, I know why. I know why. Okay, so, uh, you probably don't want to represent the delta that way. Uh, there's another way we can do it. Uh, should give a different result here. Yes. Okay. But, either way, ultimately, works. Uh, I just... I don't know, for whatever reason, I prefer being really explicit with the delta, even though I don't with the range. But that's just sort of a style thing. Either either way works the exact same. Uh, so do whatever yeah, is you, you prefer. One thing I do want to point out about ordinary fixed point types in modern systems is that you don't want to use these. Seriously. Uh, older hardware, it made sense given that the floating point types were generally slower and pretty computationally intensive, uh, which means a lot more power consumed, a lot more heat generated, stuff like that. Um, with modern systems, the floating point units have gotten so good to where you really aren't going to see speed. Just use the floating point type. But this is for ordinary fixed point types. There is another one that is actually still extremely useful. What this is, is a base 10 fixed point type, as I said before. That might not seem that special, and in fact for many applications you can completely ignore that this exists. But if you work in finance, at all, you probably have at least heard some programmers explain why COBOL is still used a lot in finance. 
And it has to do a lot with this decimal type that COBOL is able to define. And it borrows a lot from the from from that. Uh, not so much COBOL in other regards, but the uh, COBOL's decimal type support is really, really good for finance. The added precision is very helpful. Uh, for example, if we need to go at a higher delta than just cents, for example, uh, right down to the mill, I think that's Mila. We can do that. And... <sighs> it might be tempting to think that the floating point, the way floating point arithmetic works is the same, and that uh, everything that, uh, that everything would just work out to the same value. There is something called floating point rounding error, as well as some other stuff that, uh, basically, within the fractional part, uh, floating point types are not able to accurately represent all of the uh, decimal fractions. And so you get these little slight off bits. Uh, this isn't a huge issue for, say, a video game. Uh, it's it's a problem for finance. So this is, again, very important for finance. I can't really give you any great examples. Uh, it's just something that if you've done financial programming at all, you are going to recognize immediately why this is a wonderful thing. If you haven't, you're going to have no, cl no clue why this would even be useful. Um, yeah, this this covers all of the basic types. Um, as I had said, uh, other stuff are going to get their own videos, so anything like arrays or records, uh, anything that wasn't featured here is going to be in its own video. Uh, I wanted to keep this pretty simple just because it's covering simple types. I don't want to... Uh, really just hammer on the details. There are a few attributes that I have not covered here, but you should... Uh, this should be enough to get you started. Uh, for the most part, the attributes I left out are things that you really only see in specific instances anyways. Uh, these provide anything that you would expect being defined in... Um, usually... Uh, in, predefined methods in other languages. So, yeah, I don't know when I'll be able to do the second part of this. I'm not sure whether I want to cover arrays or records first, uh, but in the meantime, if you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. That actually helps quite a bit. Uh, also, don't be afraid to comment down there if you have any questions or I don't know, thank me, call me an idiot, whatever. Uh, the feedback is nice. Some of it's not always constructive, but feedback's nice. Uh, and yeah, until I get the new video out, have a good one.